start out by standing up, but I probably will be taking my chair here rather quickly since my legs aren't all that sturdy anymore. And if, any, if I see anybody uh, with a sign up after I've sat down says, for God's sake, stand up. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a reprise of uh, what I had to say at Rotary a couple of weeks back. And uh, Roger had indicated to me he would like me to consider giving some sort of insight into what things were like uh, uh, in years gone by. And uh, he indicated that as long as you've been alive, surely something has happened to you <laughs> that you can talk about. So I decided to kind of narrow it down to the one year that I think probably was the most extraordinary year of my life. Uh, and uh, I think will probably always be the most extraordinary year of my life. And uh, that goes back to the time of World War II. Uh, just for a little bit of background, I grew up here in Maquoketa, finished high school in 1942. I turned 18 in 1943 in May, uh, was inducted into the Army in August of that year, and uh, took basic training down at Fort Leonard Wood, and uh, then had another course at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, just outside of Washington. And for somebody from the Midwest whose boundaries growing up were <coughs> the state of Minnesota, Chicago, Missouri on the south, and Des Moines on the west, uh, I was starting to experience what the rest of the world was kind of looking like. Um, I think it's time to sit down. <laughs> um, after, the, after the basic training and after the uh, separate training at Fort Belvoir, uh, I started to make my way then uh, to the East Coast, uh, understanding, of course, that I was going to be sent overseas. Um, I wound up in uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey in the very early part of, August, of April of 1944, and uh, that was an opportunity to see New York City, which was a, a big deal at the time. Uh, the next day, we boarded a ship in Hoboken, New Jersey, called the SS Rangitiki, which was a British merchant ship during peacetime and had been converted into a troop ship of sorts uh, during the war. We were part of a 50 or 60 uh, ship convoy that crossed the North Atlantic uh, in the month of April, and we arrived ultimately uh, going across the ocean, into the Irish Sea, and then up the Mersey River to Liverpool. And we landed there. Uh, now all this time after basic training, I was in what were known as replacement uh, camps, which meant that I had not been assigned to any particular unit, but that obviously the word replacement meant that I was going to take somebody else's place somewhere along the line. When we got to England, um, we were, well, really, when we got to Liverpool, it was the first indication that there, there was a war on, uh, because the docks of Liverpool had been very heavily bombed by the Germans earlier in the war, and a lot of that devastation was still very obvious to us. Uh, from Liverpool, we went into central Eng uh, England for, oh, maybe a week or two, and then we're finally transferred to a high, cold hill in southwestern England overlooking the Bristol Channel. Uh, this was a tent city another, and a replacement camp. Uh, it was mostly infantrymen, uh, but there were a number of us who had been trained as uh, combat engineers, which was essentially uh, infantry training, uh, plus uh, training in teaching us how not to blow ourselves up, I guess, if we found mines or demolition of various things. Um, on this hill we were in a, in a tent city, 12-man tents, but there were enough of us piled in there that there were 16 or 18 to the tent. Uh, we got fed twice a day at four in the mo uh, 9 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon. Uh, the only exercise we really got is when they'd march us around uh, the area. It was pretty much a forlorn area. We didn't see many, if any, uh, civilians at all. 
Um, I guess the significant part about being on that hill was that I observed my 19th birthday in May and uh, lo and behold I got a present that day in the, in the sense that we were issued our M1 uh, rifles so uh, that helped me remember that I had a birthday to celebrate. Um, we knew that we would be moving whenever the invasion of Normandy took place and uh, sure enough a couple of days after the invasion on June 6th they started moving us down to the southern coast of England in the area of Weymouth and uh, we were put in a rather large camp complete with barbed wire and a lot of armed guards and so on I guess in case anybody had second thoughts about going across the channel and they examined all of the equipment and so on we had to make sure it was in working order and that we didn't have anything uh, that would be uh, at all attractive from the standpoint of, of giving away our position. For example, a white handkerchief or white underwear or things like that. Everything we had was khaki in color uh, and that went right down, down to the toilet paper. Um, about uh, two or three days of that and we were taken to the uh, docks at Portland Bill, which was the docking area around uh, Weymouth and we lined up there and a bunch of LSTs, those were the largest landing craft that were capable of carrying tanks and trucks and all big items like that, came into the dock and we had to wait for them to unload because the cargo they were bringing back from Normandy were the wounded. And so that was kind of our second introduction into the fact that there was in fact a war on. And we waited there on the dock while they unloaded, it seemed like a lot of people, uh, probably for a couple <coughs> of hours. Uh, late that day, we were uh, ushered on to the LST. And along in the LST in its bowels were tanks and trucks and so on. And the, and the human cargo was sort of just stuffed in and around and over and under those things. <coughs> Um, I think we set sail probably in the middle of the night sometime and anyway during the day of the 13th we were crossing the English Channel and uh, we had a couple of squalls uh, going across in which about half of us got seasick uh, one time or another but we arrived in, at, uh, in Normandy at Utah Beach um, as opposed to Omaha Beach um, in the late afternoon of the 13th. Um, since it was that late in the day, they didn't unload us, and we spent a night, another night on the LST. And that was kind of our third introduction to the fact that there was a war on, because the Germans were in the habit of sending planes over the beaches at night, and they'd drop a few bombs and do a little strafing and so on. It didn't disrupt what was going on all that much, but it was uh, something that kept everybody on edge. Fortunately, none of the bombs fell close to where we were, but we were much aware sitting down in the bowels of the boat and hearing those explosions go off. The next morning, uh, we unloaded. Uh, the ship, the tide was out, the ship was there, and the landing, or the front end of the ship came down, um, and we exited from there. I might say that when uh, we were ready for all this, our, our, our dress included woolens, fatigues, and then a third set of fatigues, or a second set of fatigues, but a third layer of clothing, which appeared to have been dipped in paraffin, but which supposedly was going to protect us from any gas or anything <coughs> of that sort that might get on our skin. So, and this is in June, which, and it's fairly warm in France in June. Uh, we had those three layers of clothing. We also had our rifle, uh, our ammunition belt complete with uh, mess kit and canteen, and bayonet, a full field pack on our back which included our shelter half and blanket and any number of other things, plus 
uh, what the Army liked to call our entrenching tool, which was essentially a little short-handed spade, but which became one of the more valuable items that we ever had, and a gas mask, plus a steel helmet. And uh, we also were mules to the extent that we were all given a number of bandoliers of uh, uh, ammunition uh, in clips, eight, eight bullet clips, uh, to carry ashore. And I suppose each of us probably had a half a dozen of those scattered around on us. And then last but far from least, we had our barracks bags. And our barracks bags contained everything that we as soldiers owned. In my case, uh, I had an extra pair of shoes in my barracks bag because I had big feet and I was told before we left the States that we'll give you an extra pair of shoes to take along with you because they might be hard to find once you get over there. And I also had the great foresight of getting friendly with the, uh, the sailors on the uh, LST that I was on and they invited me to help myself to a bunch of goods that they'd salvaged and I found some canned bacon, incidentally, which has been packed, a Dubuque pack of all places. <laughs> um, uh, I, a big can of uh, pineapple juice, as I recall, and, and uh, jam. And, uh, anyway, I stuffed my barracks bag full of that stuff. Well, then it occurred to us, you've you got to carry that off, too. <laughs> so as you went off the ramp, you stepped down into the water, and it just felt like you were going like this. But you finally got your feet under you. You walked ashore up over the seawall uh, to an area of dry land, and they told us, well, pile your barracks bags there. We wondered if we'd ever see them again. Well, we did. Um, the first thing that greeted our eyes as we came ashore was a whole bunch of German prisoners digging in some high ground, and it was pretty obvious that they were digging graves because there were piles of body there, bodies there, both um, American and German. And again, in June it was warm, and so we, they had to get the remains underground. Uh, the Germans had flooded all of the area behind, immediately behind the beaches, and the only land or dry land you could see were a couple of roads leading in from the beaches. Uh, the fighting had progressed far enough inland that we were not under any kind of artillery bombardment there, but it was obvious that uh, they would have been a very inviting target for the Germans because they knew obviously where the road was and that we weren't going to be anyplace else. Uh, as we walked inland, uh, the first village of any kind that I remembered, and I decided I'd kind of imprint that on my memory, it was Saint-Marie-du-Mont, which consisted of a church and maybe a couple dozen houses and buildings. And I thought, gee, I'm almost back home because here was a great big Shell Oil Company sign. Uh, I hadn't realized at that time it was really a Dutch concern anyway, and more likely they'd be over there than they would here. But anyway, uh, we got in inland, and in various places where there were wells, or what appeared to be wells, the Germans had, had put on the wells a warning sign in German that the well was poisoned. Uh, I don't know that they all were, but there, of course, obviously wasn't anybody going to be testing it to see if it was true or not. Uh, we spent most of the day walking around uh, on land, and we finally wound up in a, in a field. Uh, there were probably several hundred of us. We gathered there, and uh, a division commander, General Barton, came down, and his, his, the assistant di division commander was Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., the son of the uh, <coughs> earlier Roosevelt president. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but he had been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his exploits on D-Day. Um, Anyway, they told us we were joining the 4th Infantry Division, the best infantry division in the world, I guess, and uh, told us that the fighting was going well. Uh, most of them who were in the group were infantrymen, so they were assigned to various infantry uh, units. There were probably a couple dozen of us that were sent over to the engineer battalion, which was a part of the 4th uh, uh, Infantry Division makeup. Uh, I joined a squad there. Uh, they had been they'd been 
the squad, of course, had been on shore ever since D-Day, and they were pulled back to sort of get back together again and to replace anybody that might have been lost for any for whatever reason. Uh, it was probably a day or so after that uh, that I took part in some activity that actually had to do with the war, and we advanced on a town called Monteburg. Monteburg was a little village, probably well, maybe as big as Preston, um, and it had been heavily fought over. The Americans had taken it, the Germans had pushed them back out again, and now we were going back in. And as we advanced on the town, it was very quiet, and then one shot rang out, and it was it had obviously been a sniper, and that was the first instance I had where I actually saw somebody killed because a guy up ahead of me had gotten it right through the, the head. And I'm sure he was a replacement because his uniform was just clean and, and nicely put together. <laughs> he didn't look like the guys had been rooting around in the dirt and mud for a week or so. We got into Monteburg and the Germans had apparently withdrawn. Uh, it was quiet and we got into the middle of town where the church was located. The church was badly damaged as all churches seemed to be because they all had steeples and the steeples were the ideal place for artillery observers of course to, to call in uh, potential targets. So both sides would work the no steeples over if they hadn't already been flattened for that very reason. Uh, as we were walking around the, the ruins of the church, I, I, I saw, and incidentally in, in Normandy, uh, a lot of the people were wearing wooden shoes. Uh, and I saw a wooden shoe sitting in the rubble, and I picked it up, but I put it right back down again because there was still a foot in it. And I realized then that the civilians are suffering in this war too. But anyway, for the next couple of weeks, we advanced up the peninsula to Cherbourg. And Cherbourg was a big prize because uh, it was a ocean-going or sea-going port and represented an opportunity to, to bring material and goods and people and so on into the uh, theater of operations without having to bring them in over the beaches and unload them and put them on trucks and so on. However, the Germans, of course, had just almost completely made the harbor useless by sinking all sorts of boats in there and uh, uh, strewing mines all over the place and blowing up all the cranes and derricks and so on that might be used in unloading. So as a practical matter, I don't think Cherbourg ever became a viable port until probably three or four months later. But anyway, that was the first big prize on June 25th of 1944. One thing that happened there that was uh, I guess a wartime experience. Uh, after the place had been liberated, they put, took us back up on a hill again to kind of regroup. And then they let us go back down into the town just to see what it was like when there wasn't fighting going on. And a group of us were just sort of wandering around. And, uh, we saw a ruined building and uh, sort of was poking through it. And there was a case of Johnny Walker Scotch. And we assumed, obviously, that it must be belong to the Germans, so we felt we could take it. And we, we had it sitting there, and we were kind of arguing over who was going to get what. And about this time, a caravan of cars came by, and lo and behold, here's George Patton in one of the leading jeeps. And we thought, oh, we're probably in trouble, but he went sailing right on by and sort of gave us a nod and kept going. The other thing that happened that same day, as I was walking around in, in, in Cherbourg, I came around the corner and I literally ran right into another soldier. And of all people, it was Bob Stockham from Mary <laughs> Macoka, who's been just a year ahead of me in high school and who I'd always known. And um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, when we ran into each other, I think we both just sort of were looking, and I think we both said the same thing. What the hell are you doing over here? <laughs> and Bob had been in on D-Day, and he had been overseas just a little bit longer than I had, and his mail had been established. So he caught me up on all the things that had been going on in the Cocoa since 
well, literally since March was about the last time I'd ever had any mail, and I was not to get any mail until, well, probably two or three weeks after that, and uh, before they finally got everything established as far as uh, location and addresses and so on. Um, Bob was in the same battalion I was in, but he was in another company that was attached to a different regiment. So it was just fortuitous that I did actually run into him. Um, he was later wounded near uh, uh, Paris and uh, I think uh, taken back to uh, England and then ultimately back to the States. Um, after we, we finished at Cherbourg, uh, we went down to the area, we were still in hedgerow country as they called it, and we were in the area of St. Lo and making no headway. So on July 25th of 1944, um, I'm sure it must have been one of the biggest bombing raids of the war, certainly the biggest one I'd ever seen. And they were literally going to blast a hole in the German lines. And first it was the dive bombers and the medium bombers and the heavier bombers. And uh, approximately 3,000 planes in all before it was over with. Uh, the plan was to mark the dividing line between the Americans and the Germans with, a, with smoke. Unfortunately, by the time the heavy bombers were there, the smoke had drifted slightly back towards the Americans. And so some of the bombs that were meant for Germans fell on Americans. Um, the division I was with, the 4th, was one of those in the middle of this to hold the hole open while Patton's armor went sailing through. Um, <coughs> fortunately for me, uh, I was, uh, our company was attached to the 12th Regiment, and we were in reserve that day. So we were back a ways, and we were not actually subjected to the bombing itself, but we were close enough that when the bombs hit, you know, you like that. Anyway, it was successful. Patton went up sailing through. Um, and we moved down to an area called Mortain because the Germans had decided if they could <coughs> cut through the lines, they could cut Patton off from all of his supplies. And of course, with armored divisions, uh, the big thing was getting gasoline to them. Um, and it was at Mortain that the Americans were making a stand to keep him because they were only about 20 miles from the ocean. And uh, one of the heroes there was a fellow from Miles, uh, I think his name was Erickson, that Bob Melville wrote about many years ago. Anyway, there was a lot of fighting went on there, but in the process the Germans also put themselves into a trap because as they were being held there, Patton swung around behind them. And Montgomery came down from Caen, and they were to meet at a place called Felice. And um, they didn't quite get there in time to get a good closure, but nevertheless they did trap a couple hundred thousand Germans, and those who got out were in full flight then across northern France. And as we uh, pursued, we actually were on trucks. So the Germans were leaving as fast as they could, and they were trying to catch up. Uh, a lot of the German army still traveled with horses. Um, they were not nearly as mechanized as we were. We had vehicles for anything and everything you can imagine. Uh, so as we went across that area, we, we knew before we even saw it that German, or German columns had been caught by American dive bombers uh, because you could smell the, the burning flesh of both humans and uh, horses uh, up ahead. Anyway, as we progressed, we were aware that we must be getting kind of close to Paris. And on the 24th of August, we were told to pull off to one side. And the Free French 2nd Armored Division of General Leclerc was told, or we were told, they were going through. Uh, they were on their way They'd been designated to liberate Paris, but our regiment, the 12th, had been designated to go in behind them in case they ran into trouble. 
And so we became a part of the grand and glorious entry into the city of Paris on August 25th of 1944. So we had the celebration of, of Cherbourg on June 25th, the breakout on the 25th of July, and the 25th of August were in Paris. Uh, it, it, I really don't have the words to describe what was all was going on as far as that entry into Paris was concerned, but I've described it as sounding like the roar that goes up when Iowa scores a winning touchdown at Kinnick, or Iowa State at Jack Trice. <laughs> <laughs> but it was continuous, just literally hour after hour. People were 15, 20 feet deep on either side of us, uh, young and old. Um, one guy on our truck, he said, I've kissed so many babies, I think I'm going to take up politics when I get done. <laughs> and they all wanted to give us something, a shot of wine or a rose or whatever. And uh, here comes the spice, Tom. Um, it was pretty much uneventful in the sense of anything dramatic happening other than all these people. But once in a while, there, a few shots would ring out and down the steps would come uh, the FFE, which was the Free French Underground, and they were, of course, in full bloom uh, then. And they had a, perhaps an unhappy or luckless German soldier who hadn't taken part in the evacuation, or perhaps a Frenchman who they determined had been a collaborator. And one of the more interesting people, or groups of people that they'd bring out, were young ladies they had shaved their heads and stripped them to the waist and had uh, couché avec le boche or something like that. They printed it across the chest, uh, which meant I slept with a German. And uh, so they were being made great sport of, I guess you'd say. Um, we, spent the, we spent that day I guess helping the French celebrate that evening, people were inviting us into their houses and trying to share as much as they could with us. It was still a blackout situation, so there wasn't any electric lights or anything. And another guy and I were then told later on, well, you go back down to Boulevard Messina at this one intersection, and I don't know what we're supposed to do there, but because there are people moving around all the time. But anyway, we, he and I spent the night there, and the next morning a young lady came out and she had enough knowledge of English that she said, uh, you know, are you Americans? Yes, we're Americans. Would you come over to my parents' apartment? So we went over and her parents had heard on the underground radio that you would know they were American soldiers by two things that separated them from all the other troops <laughs> in Europe on either side. One, their shoes were different, and two, they had two-piece helmets. Um, they were curious about both. Of course, our shoes were different in that we had soles and heels on our shoes. Most of the military just had the hobnail boots, but we had heels and soles. <laughs> and, but they couldn't understand how we could have a two-piece helmet until we showed them we had a helmet liner that fit inside the steel helmet. So that satisfied them. But anyway, uh, we were there long enough that they took a picture of the other guy and I along with the young lady. And ultimately it was sent, one was sent to my parents, so uh, I'd given them my, the, the home address. So I had some proof I'd actually been to Paris, I guess. Um, any, anyway, we, we were moved later that day out to the Forest Vincennes on the southeast side of Paris. And while we were kind of collecting everybody and the whole regiment was being gathered there again, and off we went again. And we went across northern France and into Belgium and up to the German border in just a little over a week. It had taken us about two and a half months to get to 125 miles from Cherbourg to Paris, but we went the next 125 miles probably in about seven or eight days. We got to the German border, uh, and we got actually got into the Siegfried Line. The number of the pillboxes were, were uninhabited, 
and uh, because the Germans had taken the, the, the weapons out of there um, to use them in other places and hadn't got back in time to re-equip re them. And um, Charlie Beasley and I were the uh, demolition experts in our squad. We gathered together all of the um, explosive or sort of a plastic type that would stick against things. We got all we could find and put it in one of those uh, uh, dugouts and, and set it off. And it didn't even move it. And the only thing we ever accomplished, we blew a back door off of it. Um, and later on, the Germans did occupy a lot of the, reoccupy a lot of the pillboxes that had been in the line and not yet into our area. And uh, there was a lot of heavy fighting that went on to capture those things then. So the fall was kind of uneventful in the sense that we had kind of run out of supplies. All the supplies were still coming in on the beaches and they had to bring them by truck all the way across. Uh, the French and Belgian rail lines had been knocked out of order by the Americans prior to the invasion. Um, and the big demand, of course, was again with the armored divisions and all the gasoline they had to have, which you couldn't bring by pipeline or truck. Uh, tankers or anything of that sort they didn't really have. They were all in these five gallon jerry cans that they'd load up with the big uh, trucks and, and haul them that way. <clears throat> so along came about the first of November and we were told one day you're going to to move tonight very quickly and very abruptly <coughs> and very quietly into the Hurtgen Forest to relieve the 28th Infantry Division. So we moved during the night. We moved into the foxholes that the 28th Division most recently occupied. In the morning, we were awakened with an artillery barrage from the Germans and, and snow falling. And the artillery barrage included a lot of propaganda leaflets, and the big headline on it was, Welcome 4th Infantry Division to the Hurtgen Forest, factory of death, and then they went on to recount the number of American divisions that had already been there and been all chewed up. Well, that was to be our fate as well, apparently. Uh, but on an attack, our, uh, our squad was called up because they'd run into some mines. We no more got there than we, were getting, we got fired on from all sides, so we jumped into foxholes that we could find. And, a lot of small arms fire and artillery and mortars and so on were going. And the foxhole that one other fellow from my squad and I jumped into, <laughs> it had water and mud in it. And we everything else is going wrong here. But we were also subjected to uh, mortar fire. And mortars, of course, shoot like that. Art artillery kind of like that. So. Uh, as far as artillery is concerned, you can tell when it's close to you. Uh, if, if you remember war movies, a lot of times you'll hear the shells whistling. Well, you didn't pay attention to those because they were a long ways away from you. It's, when, it's the more the shell sounded like a freight train coming right at you that you knew it was more direct. And I had been blown out of a couple of foxholes during my summer in France. And I recognized that sound, and, and for just an instant, I heard that sound again in the forest. And a mortar shell came right in the foxhole with us. And I think, fortunately, because we had mud and water, it sunk in and exploded. And it blew us back against the back side of the thing. And I was aware right away that I'd been hit. And just for an instant, I, oh, I wonder if my foot's still there. And I could see that it was. My shoe was gone, but uh, I had a foot full of, uh, of uh, shrapnel. And uh, there was an aid station over maybe 20 yards or so. And uh, I yelled for the medic, and he just sort of waved and said, come over here. <laughs> so I crawled over there, and they had kind of a bunker set up there with logs over it and then dirt over it, so it's relatively 
you see from shrapnel because the big thing in, in the forest were tree bursts. The artillery hit trees and they just scatter over the thing in all directions. Um, he bound up my wound and there were already a couple other guys in there that had been wounded and that was to be my home for the rest of the 10th, all day the 11th and all day the 12th. Uh, <coughs> we were cut off on all sides. Uh, there were probably maybe 150 of us down there. Uh, on the evening of the 12th, uh, an officer came by and said, we're going to try to fight our way out in the morning before we lose any more people. Because obviously being cut off, you're, there was no food, no, no ammunition supplies, no, no nothing. Fortunately, it was snowing, so we had water occasionally. And, a medic or a soldier would go out and make a snowball and have it into us and we chew on that. But anyway, we, we kind of thought then, yeah, if they get out, they're going to come back. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot you could do about that. So they did leave a medic with us and they did pull out. And we knew they were successful because about two hours later, American artillery started to come in to where we were, uh, I think on the assumption that Germans probably moved in. Uh, it was another couple hours before the uh, Germans showed up and then a squad came through there and I might say the medic we had was not wounded. He was in good shape and they had left him behind I suppose maybe to help our morale a little bit. But unfortunately he was a young Jewish fellow and he spent most of his time talking to us about how the Germans didn't seem to be taking many prisoners in, in the Hurricane Forest and he, and he knew that we're probably all doomed as soon as they see that I'm a Jew. Um, <clears throat> the Germans came through, and some guy stuck his head in the Vasudlos or something like that, and, and uh, the medic jumped up with his red helmet, red cross helmet, so uh, for wounded, for wounded, for wounded. So they ordered us to get out of the holes. The other two guys in the holes who had broken legs, and they just couldn't move. So I could crawl out, so I had the benefit of listening to this guy. He was a, a young 17-year-old who spoke pretty good English and said he'd been fighting ever since Normandy. He killed a lot of Americans. And I guess to emphasize his point, he fired off his sort of like a submachine gun. We called them grease guns. They were small and light. And then he told us, get back in the hole we're going on to make contact with the enemy and if some other German soldiers come through here behind us they might not understand that you've already surrendered <laughs> they might shoot you. So we got back in the hole and it was the next morning before they came through to haul us out of there and they did haul us back to an aid station and then that's ultimately I was taken to Durham, Germany and operated on and that was kind of an experience too because uh, there were a whole lot of German wounded there Obviously, they were taking them first. And there was one other American and myself, and they took the. We were the very last two to go, and uh, they took the other guy in. And a few minutes later, they called me in. Well, the other guy was just yelling and carrying on something terrible. And I thought, oh my God, they're not giving us any anesthetic. But pretty soon, the guy says, Count, count, and uh, the operation took place okay. Uh, I was moved to a, a, an old monastery on top of a hill in Siegburg, Germany, which was on the east side of the Rhine, where we crossed in Bonn, and was there for two or three weeks where we had a Russian doctor and two or three elderly German nuns. And we were in the attic of the uh, monastery. I was then moved to another um, sort of a recuperation, I guess, uh, prison camp, uh, which was on the west side of the Rhine. Uh, up near Cologne, and I was there during the Battle of the Bulge. We found out about that in a rather unique way too, because all during this time the only planes you'd see in the sky were Americans, but all of a sudden there were German planes all over the place, and a big dogfight took place right over the camp. And uh, among the several planes that were shot down was one American plane. The pilot ejected and landed right in our prison camp, and he had a copy of the Stars and Stripes, which was the Army newspaper, and so we all took turns reading that and finding out what the bulge was about. Uh, 
from Hoffenstall after I got back to the, most of this time, if I got around, I had crutches. Um, <clears throat> I got kind of back on my feet again. And uh, so they moved us to another camp at, at Vaughan, back across the river. And this time we walked across um, to a place called Hot Hole, which was a, a suburb of Vaughan. We were only there a few days when, during a night British bombing raid on Vaughan, they also included our prison camp as well, and they knocked it flat. And so, and this is in the coldest part of the winter, and the Germans were very obviously upset. Uh, they lined us all up and went through a counting procedure that they seemed to have as a special uh, kind of way of uh, irritating us. Uh, we'd line up in a row and then about four deep, but they could never ever make the numbers come out right all, all over again. They finally, after most of the day, they decided to walk us back over to Siegburg, which is only a few <coughs> miles from put us in an abandoned factory there for a couple of days, and then moved us over to the rail yards and put us in boxcars, and of course sealed the boxcars late in the afternoon. And we traveled rather slowly all that night down to a place called Limburg. And it was, uh, it was a rail junction, and the Germans had very thoughtfully put the prison camp right in among where all the rails crossed. So it had been subjected to bombing on several occasions. But there was a big camp, there were probably 20,000 prisoners there. Uh, I was only there a couple of weeks, and they decided they had to move us back in and uh, further. So we walked on the 22nd of February, Washington's birthday, we started walking, spent five days walking back to a place called Bad Ore. And that was the last camp I was in. Uh, just a quick description of the camps. Uh, none of the camps I was in had electricity, none of them had heat, none of them had running water. The uh, latrines were outdoor latrines. Uh, we got fed once or twice a day. Um, I had such things as, as raw horse meat to eat and uh, kind of look, they said it was blood sausage, but it looked more like it was just coagulated blood. But when you're very hungry, everything looks good. And so it was there that we were liberated on the uh, 2nd of April. It was one of the early camps to be liberated. And I can tell you a lot of things about that, but uh, my time is running out, so I'll pass on over. But anyway, uh, on the 7th of, uh, of April, enough of the Army had caught up to the advance uh, troops that they those of us who still had some sort of, my wound was still bleeding and I had scabies and all that and a number of other things. They hauled us back to uh, France uh, and to particularly to Paris and we landed at Le Bourget Field, which is where Limburg had landed 18 years earlier. Uh, they cleaned us up, they deloused us, they gave us clean clothes and I was weighed there for the first time. I might say in the fall, in, in um, Belgium, I'd weighed myself in a railroad station, and I'd weighed 95 kilos, which is around 210 pounds. When I was weighed at Le Bourget Field, I weighed 128 pounds. So I was, uh, and now I'm about 240, so I was about half then of what I am now. Uh, they took us uh, from Le Bourget to a, to a recovery <coughs> hospital on the uh, west side of Paris at Le Bessonnet. And I was there for two or three weeks, um, and most of us had a probably a rather close bout with death because they had about 40 of us that were brought back to the prison. <coughs> and they let us eat anything and everything we wanted. And after that first day, everybody started having problems, and there were, I suppose there were around 40 of us there. But two of them actually died because of the, too much food that they couldn't handle. Um, that would have been <coughs> on about the 8th that I know I had the problem and they rushed us over into the intensive care unit or something. The next thing I remember was somebody saying, did you know Roosevelt died yesterday? And But I, once I got on the road to recovery, it was quick. I was back up to around 200 pounds by the time I came back home in, in May. And I, that was kind of nice too in that instead of taking a boat back, we flew from Orly Field in Paris 
to the Azores, up to Newfoundland, and down to LaGuardia. And uh, my perfect day ended on a very sad note in that when I got to uh, Floyd Bennett Field, uh, we were given a call home. Uh, after some delay, I got in contact with my mother. I visited with her for a while. And I said, well, how come Dad didn't answer the phone? I put the call in for him. She said, he never got any of our messages. I said, no. She said, well, it, I have some sad news for him. I said, you don't mean he died. And she said, yes. He died on April 2nd, which was the same day that I had uh, uh, been liberated. Um, he'd been diagnosed with cancer in January in on March 20th, this is from my mother's diary, she said, we got the bad news from Dr. Tidrick today. And two weeks later, he was dead. So, and it's 43, so uh, that sort of ruined the perfect return to this country. Uh, I don't know that I want to end on a sad note, other than just to say that uh, they took us back to uh, a hospital near us, and at the time, Schick Hospital in Clinton, was a recovery hospital, and so obviously that's close to Makoka, so that's where I got taken. And my first trip home, as far as conquering heroes are concerned, was I went out to 136 and hitchhiked back to Makoka. <laughs> <laughs> so, no questions, I'm sure. So. <laughs>